Humans are a monogamous species, relatively speaking. The traditional relationship is usually formed when we find somebody to love and start a family together. But it's not always such an equal pairing in other animal species. As we saw in the Australian bower birds, the males are highly promiscuous and will mate with as many females as will choose him. Those females, however, are usually quite monogamous, choosing one and only one male to sire her offspring. Like the bowerbirds, these elephant seal males are also polygynous, meaning that the alpha male who has secured his status as chief gets to enjoy a whole harem of females to himself. Each of these females, again, will remain faithful to him alone. This is not true for female butterflies and bees, who will mate many times with many different males, in order to secure a diversity of genes for her offspring, as well as the energy and nutrient resources that will come with their sperm packets or spermatophores. This polyandry, or females mating with many males, is taken to the extreme in the honeybee, where the male makes the ultimate nuptial gift as he blasts off his genitalia into the female bee upon ejaculation as his last dramatic act in life. These polyandrous females show that mating systems are not made up of one-size-fits-all kinds of animals. To be sure, most male animals don't blow it all on their one and only chance at reproduction, and even in polyandrous mating systems, there's often a high degree of polygyny as well. Given that female animals are most limited in reproduction by the number of offspring they can produce, and that males are only limited by the number of copulations that they can get, it is perhaps not surprising to find that in many, if not most animal species, that males have a tendency towards promiscuity and getting lots of mating action. A more mysterious and interesting situation to note would be in those fewer situations where males are monogamous, and to wonder, why is it that way? Clown shrimp populations are not very dense, and the females are few and far between, spread out over large areas. Also, the timing of the female's fertility is variable and can happen at any time of the year. When a male clown shrimp finds a female that is receptive to him, He'll stay with her as a faithful monogamous partner because he wants to be there when she becomes fertile and ready to mate. This mate-finding hypothesis implies that male animals can become monogamous to their female partners if finding a female is so unpredictable that he's best to stick around when he finds one. In other animals, such as the seahorse, a male will incubate his clutch of fry in an abdominal pouch until they're ready to swim off on their own. He only has enough room in that pouch for the one clutch, so he has no interest in remating and will remain true to his mated female partner in a monogamous relationship. Here the hypothesis for male monogamy relies on the mate assistance aspect, in that he's contributing important time or resources to his mate and their offspring, and can't spread that around over other families of broods as well. This is the context that more closely matches that of humans, where the males play important roles as parents and contribute greatly in terms of investments of time, care, and resources to the raising of their offspring. We'll come back to this topic when we look at human behavior in greater detail in our last and final episode of this series. Perhaps the most emblematic examples of monogamous relationships and cooperative breeding behavior is seen in birds, where males and females both contribute importantly to taking care of their offspring. This cooperation allows each parent to see more offspring survive to fledging the nest than would be the case if they were to take on the parenting task alone. Having one parent incubating the eggs in the nest at all times allows them to remain at relatively stable and warm temperatures to best promote the embryological development inside. There are some situations where male animals would in fact prefer to be promiscuous, but that they are prevented from being so by their attentive and controlling female partner. I bet we all know someone like that, eh? 
Well, this is certainly the case for male and female carrion beetles. These insects will mate and lay eggs in a carcass or a pile of excrement that they find so that their larva offspring can feast within it once they hatch. However, as soon as they're done mating and the female begins to lay their eggs, the male will begin calling for a new female by releasing his sex pheromone attractant. If his first female catches wind of this, quite literally in this case, She'll slap him down and put an end to his attempts at philandering because any new clutch of eggs that's laid into her carcass or dung will compete with her own offspring and decrease their chances of survival. This is a chance the male is willing to take because he would have two clutches of eggs instead of one and would likely find more surviving offspring overall with an added attempt at reproduction. That female would only suffer a loss in her reproductive output and rightly sets her male straight about where he needs to focus his attention. And it ain't with the other females. She makes that point clear enough. In this case of female enforced monogamy, the poor male has no choice but to remain faithful and can only fantasize about a life of promiscuous sex. Reproduction is often very costly to females who are usually saddled with the greatest investment into sexual reproduction. With the burden of egg production, gestation, birthing, and often postnatal care and protection of the young, reproduction is a costly activity for most female animals, and the decisions to get involved in sex with a male are not taken lightly, given the potential costs of making a bad decision. For these reasons, we're accustomed to thinking of female animals as being careful and choosy about their partners, and certainly leaning towards monogamy over promiscuous sexual behavior. In many animal species, however, female promiscuity or polyandry is the norm. There are two kinds of benefits that polyandrous females can gain by mating with more than one male at a time, genetic benefits or material benefits. In the first case, Females can gain increased genetic diversity in their offspring, allowing for greater adaptability in the face of uncertain futures. In the latter case, they may receive something tangible from the males, like help or resources that increase in quality or quantity the more males she mates with. Female butterflies not only receive sperm upon copulation, but also a donation from the male in the form of other contents in their spermatophore, or sperm package. Male butterflies make important donations of nutrients through sexual copulation that can be used to maintain the female's metabolism and egg development, as well as packaged into the eggs themselves to feed the developing embryos within. In both cases, these nuptial gifts benefit the male by improving the female's reproductive output of his offspring. For the female, it's a case of the more the merrier, because she gets a double whammy with each copulation, nutritional resources for herself and baby food for her eggs. In these cases, we find that female butterflies are highly polyandrous as a strategy to maximize her gains in the costly process of reproduction. In mice and bank foals, males will act aggressively and kill offspring of other males in a way to free up the females to mate with him instead. These infanticidal behaviors are a bit distasteful to say the least, but they help these males to increase their own reproductive success at the expense of the other males instead. Females of these species will deliberately mate with more males than are necessary as a means by which to confuse the males into being unsure about which offspring are actually their own. This confusion surrounding the paternity of the young in their midst has the effect of reducing rates of infanticide on the pups of the polyandrous females, compared to those that only mated with a single male. This form of polyandry seems to act like a smokescreen around a female's offspring and protects them from murderous males that might target them if they didn't suspect that they could be the father. In other cases, the benefits can be a little bit more subtle. The yellow-toothed cavy is a kind of wild guinea pig in South America that has a fertility problem, where there's an unusually high rate of stillbirths and infant deaths. As a result, 
Female cavies will often mate with three or four males just to ensure that she'll get a good enough quality of sperm from one of them to ensure that she will carry healthy and viable offspring. This fertility assurance approach is an evolved strategy to favor having offspring with a good quality of genes to allow their proper development and survival in a species plagued by infertility issues. An indirect consequence of the polyandrous behavior of yellow-toothed cavi females is that the males find themselves in a situation where sperm competition is fierce and the race to fertilize the ovules is more intense than in most other species. The male adaptive response in these cavies lies in the massive size of their testicles that allow for huge sperm loads that give them the edge in the competition by using a shock and awe approach to overwhelming her reproductive tract and hoping to become the sire of her offspring. Like all behaviors, they don't come for free, and polyandry is no exception. One very real and potentially harmful effect of engaging in increased levels of sexual activity is by catching a sexually transmitted disease. As an aside, remember that microbial-borne diseases like bacteria and viruses also need to reproduce and locate their next host to colonize. So they usually infect body systems that are conducive to their own propagation. That's why most infectious diseases either affect the respiratory system, where they'll get coughed or sneezed onto their next victim, or the circulatory system, where they will be picked up and taxied through the blood feeding of a mosquito, or via sexual transmission. We can argue that sexual reproduction is the meaning of life, because without it, most life as we know it wouldn't exist, and it would be a much less pleasurable world to live in. Since most animals will eventually attempt to engage in sexual reproduction, it's a common body system to be targeted by parasites and pathogens. As usual, when a particular behavioral strategy has higher than average costs, evolution favors adaptations that can reduce those costs, while preserving all of the potential benefits. We see this in primates with varying degrees of promiscuity in their evolved mating systems. When the frequency of multiple matings increases from one primate species to the next, we also note a corresponding increase in white blood cell count. This latter is an important metric of immune function and can be seen as an adaptation for increased immune protection in those species that are more likely to need it. Those promiscuous primate species have evolved a protective function in their immune system as a response to taking the riskier approach to sex allowing them to benefit more from the gains of multiple matings. Despite all the variations on the theme of who mates with whom and how many, one approach rises above all as the most common and standard one, that of male promiscuity and tendencies towards polygyny. Most male animals would probably like to mate as many times as possible, and in many animal species they do. Multiple mating in males, or polygyny, has its evolutionary origins in the relatively cost-free approach to reproduction in sperm donation to fertile females, especially in cases where males provide little to no care or protection of the offspring, the desire is even stronger to produce as many young as they possibly can, and several mating strategies have evolved from this approach. When females exist in clustered groups in the environment, as is often the case among vertebrates, it creates a situation where males may attempt to control the females into a harem and monopolize their reproductive rights. Females of the tropical blackbird species Montezuma oropendola build their hanging hammock-like nests in groups within the same tree, which creates an opportunity for the male to guard those females and protect them from intruding males looking for some mating action. These controlling alpha males may enjoy the reproductive benefits coming from his harem of nesting females because of this convenient clustering that he can manipulate and protect as his own. In other cases, the females may not be grouped conveniently, but something that they want is, such as food or material resources that are important to the females. 
When resources can be controlled by the males, it becomes another way to act as gatekeeper and to gain the reproductive benefits that come with that privilege. African cichlid fish females will lay their eggs in empty seashells and crawl in to protect her brood until they hatch. The strategizing males of this species will collect all the shells in his territory and protect them from other thieving males, so that he can entice a female to mate and nest in a shell from among his collection. The resource defense form of polygyny allows entrepreneurial males to barter their goods for some mating opportunities, as if it were a going-out-of-business sale. In many animal species, the males don't defend females or their resources, but rather put themselves on display and invite the females to come and check them out. Often, a central advertising arena forms over time in traditional locations that offer good visibility or a convenient central meeting ground. In these display arenas, known as leks, males jostle for position and strut their stuff while the females gather on the periphery and observe and judge them on their merits. These lecking displays tend to occur in species that are otherwise widely dispersed and provide a temporary and distinct location to satisfy their needs for getting together at reproduction time. Many species of grouse, such as the greater sage grouse, will gather in leks on the great prairies to engage in this temporary meat market, where the males are on display for the window shopping females. The males that have the most impressive features and are outcompeting the rival males will gain the eye of most females, and he will have his first choice in the pickings that will follow. Lastly, what is a male to do if the females are spread out all over the place and not interested in coming to his show-off displays? In these desperate situations, many males are reduced to scramble competitions, where they race around trying to find the females wherever they are and hoping to be there at the right time for mating. This is the case for male thirteen-lined squirrels, who live in a habitat where all the females are hidden away in burrows and dens all over the place. These males will patrol the full extent of their habitat, investigating each female's burrow and having a sniff to get an assessment of her hormonal status. If he gets the impression from her hormonal profile that she's about to enter estrus or to begin ovulation, he will repeatedly come back day after day, hoping that during one of those return visits, he'll be greeted by a fertile and receptive female. Sexual reproduction may end up being one of the most important and consequential decisions of many animals' lives. But for many others, it's no big whoop, and they'll give it away for free. Although male and female strategies are inevitably going to differ, they'll each be the result of these biological features but also of the ecological context, which will play a big role in determining which of these strategies will work and which ones won't. Mating strategies are one of the various adaptive features that have evolved in order to help participating animals maximize their winnings when playing one of life's most important contests, the mating game. <laughs>